This week on Forward, founder and CEO of Good Information Inc. and Courier Newsroom, Tara McGowan, joins us to talk misinformation and what we can do about it. This week on Forward. It's my pleasure to welcome to Forward Civic Entrepreneur, the founder and CEO of Good Information and the Courier Newsroom, which we're going to talk about uh, at length. Tara McGowan. Welcome, Tara. Thanks so much for having me, Andrew. It's great to be here. Oh, Tara, you're working on a problem. So we'll, we'll retrace your steps so people have a sense of your background, which is fascinating. But you're working on a problem that's near and dear to my heart, uh, which is the fact that local news is dying. Um, you have over 2,000 local papers that have gone out of business. You probably know the numbers better than I do, um, and they, they've probably gotten worse since I looked at it. Uh, so what what is the situation with local news? Yeah, it's, it's really, really bleak, Andrew, as you mentioned. Um, it got significantly worse during the pandemic, as yeah. you can imagine, the sure. shuttering of newsrooms. And, you know, writ large, this has been happening for over a decade now, and it's really um, the result of local news organizations having relied on one specific stream of revenue. Which was? Advertising, sure. traditional advertising um, in their newspapers, local um, and regional advertisers. And, you know, as the advertising industry got entirely uh, imploded and revolutionized by big tech and social media platforms. Also known as Craigslist and Facebook, but continue. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, uh, local news organizations who were already struggling to get by with resources couldn't keep up, couldn't evolve their business models quickly enough. So what's been happening is they're either shutting down or sometimes worse, they're getting bought up by hedge funds that are buying them up for different pieces, selling them off, um, just focusing on how to monetize them and laying off the journalists and um, and not really investing in the mission any longer of these of these organizations and institutions. And the the really scary part, I mean, it, it, one, it's just terrible for people not to have access to local information yes. in their communities. How can you have a functioning democracy if you don't know what the heck's going on? That's right. Or just a functioning society, right? I mean, we 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 are still going through a pandemic and interest in local information was at its highest during the early months of the pandemic because the information was all over the place, right? States and uh, and municipalities were making decisions different than the federal government. And so people didn't know, you know, what, what the rules were in their state when it came to schools and school openings and closures and mask mandates. And yet there there's so limited local information that's yep. available and trusted. To your point on democracy, there's a direct correlation between access to trustworthy local information and civic participation. So when you don't have access to that information, you're less likely to participate. You know, wh why, why would you vote if uh, there's no one who's even telling you who's running, what the issues are? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And if you're relying on national media to do that, well, they're, they're focused. Really <laughs> no, they're focused yeah. on a totally different audience that has a you know a different agenda. They're focused on high information, yeah. elite, coastal information news consumers and so they're talking about horse races and they're talking about really you and, know and they tend to be much more uh polarizing and political that's right that's yeah. exactly right they nationalize everything right and yeah. so you're not really understanding the impacts of policy decisions or candidates positions or platforms on yourself your family your community at all at that level yeah what, one of the things i love about local news is it tends to be less ideological less partisan because if you're going to talk about high school sports or the bridge being rebuilt. I mean, there are only so many ways to, <laughs> that's right, that's right. to, to kind of frame that information. Um, so let's now retrace your steps. Uh, the people who've been listening to me in the podcast know that I've been deeply concerned about the uh, the death or near death of local papers uh, for the last number of years. And I think it's completely messed up that as a country, we haven't taken greater measures to try and combat that. I mean, you're actually devoting all, all of your energies and waking time to, to trying to make that uh, problem better, which you know is uh, one reason I'm so excited to sit down with you. Um, but you started your career, I want to say, uh, in TV news and then got bitten by the political bug uh, when uh, Obama ran for president. That's right. I was a journalist. I went to journalism school here in New York, um, and I started my career at 60 Minutes, which is 
uh, really an incredible experience, really educational, formative. Um, it's still, you know, a really unique news magazine. Uh, they were number one in the ratings for a long time. Is that, I don't know if that's still the case. I don't know if they're still number one, but I know that they still reach younger people increasingly. Like they're still really kind of the, the gold standard of journalism that crosses generations. It's, it's pretty yeah. incredible because they haven't changed their format at all, um, which really defies uh, a, a lot of the industry. Um, in terms of being able to survive. But it was an incredible experience in a lot of ways. It was also a mixed bag working for corporate media. And I'm sure some of your listeners have heard things about CBS News over the years. So I worked there during that. But um, overall, I, 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 I was uh, lucky to be on the team that covered the 2008 presidential election. I did get very swept up in then Senator Obama's candidacy. And I made the decision in uh, 2009, late 2009, to leave journalism and try my hat at politics and moved to D.C. cold and started a career in democratic politics that I went on to do for about over a decade. Wow. So you moved down there um, to try and help move the country in a, a positive direction after Obama became president. And Obama uh, was something of a magnet for people who wanted to try and be of service uh, in some way. I have friends who moved to D.C. Uh, either to become part of the administration or otherwise. Uh, I remember when Obama won. I mean, that, that was like uh, uh, a real cause for celebration uh, uh, in, you know, here in New York and uh, among uh, my friends. So uh, you worked in democratic politics and uh, you became kind of a heavyweight in reaching large numbers of people through digital campaigns. Uh, you worked on the Hillary campaign, I want to say, in, in some capacity. No, not the campaign. Um, I worked on the IE side, so the independent expenditure side. I worked for Priorities USA in 2016, the largest super PAC on the left. Um, my husband worked on the campaign, so we actually f were firewalled from each other. Which was, <laughs> How did that go? <laughs> we got married during that campaign, and so our lawyers actually did get on a call about whether we needed NDAs at our very small wedding, because there were people from both sides. But uh, it worked out because we never spoke, so <laughs> we were living in different places, both preoccupied with the election. So, um, But yeah, I was on the super PAC side. I ran a $42 million digital advertising program against Trump. Um, obviously, it was it was not enough. No one thing is anyhow. But I learned a lot in the process. And uh, it was my first role really having a seat at the table of, you know, senior level Democratic operatives. I had been really lucky to do a lot of jobs. I'd worked on the Obama campaign in 2012, um, doing production and video production and digital video storytelling. And then I was put in this role of priorities, and uh, and it was a fantastic opportunity because they they they'd always been an organization that focused entirely on traditional media and really negative advertising. So television, mail, um, radio, uh, really kind of you know taking one for the team on the the independent dark money side to do kind of the negative work against Mitt Romney in 2012 and other things. And um, I was given the opportunity to envision what a digital uh, program and department would look like there. And so it was a really exciting opportunity. I got to build my own team, um, but I also was pretty horrified as I learned how much power consultants had in democratic politics and in politics generally. Um, and I'm talking about everyone from pollsters to traditional media consultants um, and even digital consultants who I worked with at the time. There, there just was, there was, a level of hubris just in sort of that community and not feeling a need or any incentive to innovate or experiment with new strategies or tactics. And I really felt in that role before the election that we were falling behind and not really staying up to speed on how the platforms like Facebook and Instagram were evolving so, so quickly and and how Trump in particular was was really taking advantage of these tools in a way that that our consultants weren't encouraging us to do the same. Wow. So you you had a front row seat to the the fact that hey, maybe the democratic machinery wasn't uh, keeping pace 
Yeah, and it was it was really disheartening because I came out of the Obama campaign and culture that was incredibly empowering to younger people on the campaign and to digital strategy. And so I think that it really was a, a little bit of just resting on the laurels of that. We don't need to innovate. We are the ones who are good at digital. And yet the the technology was changing so quickly and gaining so Four much more powerful. Four years is an eternity in yes. this space. Yeah, completely. One year can be an eternity if you don't keep up to speed on the changing algorithms and policies and ad tech stacks like you, you really don't know what you're doing and so I got told all the time to just trust the consultants and if I hear anyone just tell me to trust them my like spidey senses go up and so I started to to peel away more of the work in-house from the consultants and that kind of turned into the model I ended up starting an organization around in 2017 called acronym which was a 501c4 committed to increasing investment, experimentation, innovation in digital outreach to increase civic participation, ultimately, and to support progressive causes and candidates. So let's unpack this consultant line of thought, um, because I, I've met and worked with a lot of consultants. Uh, and one of the tough things about the consultants uh, is that they kind of coalesce around a particular campaign uh, and then they move on to the next one. And so would they prefer to win? Sure. <laughs> we think, right? We you know, think, yeah. Like, uh, it is, is it an existential threat for them? No, uh, because if they're consulting at a really high level, it, it might be their seventh or 17th campaign, uh, right. you know? And, and so is there gonna be an 18th campaign for them? Yes. Um, and so what it reminds me of for people who are into sports, it's like an NFL head coach who's much better off losing by seven points professionally <laughs> than, That's right. than, than trying to do something uh, out of the box and then maybe losing by 20. That's right. But there's, maybe giving yourself a chance to win. That's right. There's a, there's a lot of failing up. There's very little accountability uh, because, you know, the, the same way you can't take – credit, even though many folks do, for winning an entire election based on one strategy or tactic, you also can't take the fall necessarily uh, for, for a campaign losing based on a strategy or tactic. And that was that was really enlightening to me because I, I really was uh, very idealistic. I was like, aren't we all in this together? Don't to we win? all want to win? Cause, Don't we, yeah. Right. Don't we want to throw anything and everything at the wall? Um, and, and also at the time in 2016, there, you know, there was, and this wasn't unique to my team organization at all, there was really a very, very deep and broad sense that Hillary had it in the bag. Sure. Um, People were already just picking out jobs for themselves. Right. That's right. And I, you know, for the years and years that I had done this work, I never, ever once believed any campaign that I was working on or working on behalf of was, was a shoe in because... Um, one, you really, there's so much we just don't know ever, to be honest. I mean, we know that polls are broken. We, so the information that you have is, is really fraught to begin with. And, and also, it's just not a way to motivate yourself to try and think, uh, you know, around quarters and what the other side is doing because they're tireless and ruthless. And so it was just, it was a really eye-opening experience for me. I became somebody invited into rooms of donors and leaders in the party whose hair was on fire about how this could have happened after 2016. And I didn't have, you know, the answers, but I, I was able to shed some light on on what we weren't doing when it came to leveraging tools like Facebook and thinking outside the box on reaching voters and um, and also just Democrats, you know, this is this is not a, a hot take. They've always had a messaging problem a little bit. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But I was just really frustrated at how out of touch yeah. folks felt with people. Sure. A and if they lose, they blame the voters half the time. It's like, oh, like, you know, the, the, these voters. So that's right. Immoral or wrong headed. It's like, well, may maybe your goal should be to try and uh, figure out where people are and then win these things and then deliver. Do some listening, right? And and I think that was part of the piece is that the, the being out of touch of, of where people were and how they were feeling and what they were concerned about or frustrated with or anxious about, it started to extend to where they were actually getting their information. We were, you know, continuing to spend, and Democrats still do, hundreds of millions of dollars on television advertisements that are reaching an, an, an increasingly Sliver. tiny slice of the electorate of regular older whiter voters 
while we, we may have, or may not be able to convince or push, you know, like their like that's their, right. their their attitude or a vote might be fixed. That's right. So it just it felt like it felt like walking into a house where everything was upside down and feeling like, am I the crazy one? Or? No, no, you were the sane one for sure. Uh, and you decided to do something about it, which is awesome. All right, folks, we all know it. This economy sucks. And if you've got a small business, this inflation situation isn't doing you any favors right now. It's harder than ever to stay profitable. So if you're looking for a way to cut costs, mailing and shipping is a great place to start. And that's why we use stamps.com to mail and ship and get access to exclusive discounts at great rates on shipping from USPS and UPS. It's easy and awesome. Stamps.com saves you time, money, and stress for more than 20 years. They've been doing this. They've been indispensable for over 1 million businesses, including ours. Stamps.com gives you access to all the post office and UPS shipping services you need right from your computer and discounts you can't find anywhere else. No matter what business you're in, Stamps.com can help you save on shipping. So whether that's sending invoices or Etsy shops sending your products or warehouse shipping out truckloads of orders, Stamps.com is a mailing shipping solution for you. So here's the deal. So I want you guys to start mailing and start shipping with Stamps.com and keep more money in your pocket every stinking day, especially in today's economy with high inflation and costs are of utmost importance. So sign up with the promo code YANG for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts at all. So just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code YANG. I, I do want to dig into this a little bit more just because it, it's something uh, a lot of Americans feel. So so the, the Democratic Party um, does have a messaging problem. Uh, it, the loss to Donald Trump in 2016, um, in, in my mind, uh, was born of like a, a lot of issues. But uh, but a lot of it was that people were counting their chickens before they're hatched and thinking like we have this in the bag and like let's figure out who's going to sit in what chair. Uh, uh, afterwards. And then when Hillary lost to Trump, um, you didn't really feel like there was like a reckoning or people coming together and being like, hey, like what, what's what's wrong with uh, us that we could lose to this guy? Uh, you know, I mean, like, and, and this got me to a point where I decided to run for president where I was like, hey, I think I can contribute. I was going to say you did something too. <laughs> yeah, oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good fun. Um, and so then uh, Joe Biden uh, ekes out a win against Trump in 2020, and people should know how close that race was. It was in, not like, a landslide. Yeah, I mean, it's 44,000 votes right. in uh, three or four swing states. Yep. Um, uh, and th there is the, this sense still that uh, Democrats haven't necessarily learned or uh, evolved. I mean, th there is also this fractious nature of the party uh, in terms of trying to legislate where anyone who has been paying attention this past number of months has gotten this like, oh, no, like, they, they, you know, this team doesn't seem to have it like fully together and they're not <laughs> really, really delivering. Um, it, we all feel like they're going to get wrecked in November, which uh, will probably happen. Uh, and, and then if Trump runs again, uh, like, do you trust the Democrats to defeat them, uh, to, to defeat Trump in, in 24? It's like, I don't. I mean, looking at it, it's like, is, is there like an excellent chance that uh, Democrats lose not once but twice uh, to, to Trump? Um, and in part because I feel like the lessons learned um, haven't really been taken uh, to heart. So th this are, these are some of the things that motivate me. I'm not sure how many uh, of these thoughts you've had. But <laughs> you decided to, to then try and solve some of the problems and say, okay, I'm going to start an organization that does things the way that I, I think people would be excited about. Yeah. And, and I want to, I want to get back to kind of your, the, your sort of thoughts on where things are going and where they could go in 22 and 24. Cause I think I might have a little bit more optimism than you, but it's not based on the democratic party. It's actually based on the American people, but we can circle back. I to do that. like the American people. I, do, you, you I, do, I, have, I have faith in them. If, if they have access to good information, we'll get there and are empowered and feel empowered. Um, but but yeah, it, I mean, you're not wrong that a lot of lessons hadn't been heated. I do think I do think that there were constellations of really exciting 
innovation and startup organizations that didn't exist before 2016. There was a flurry of them that came out of the woodwork that were not sanctioned by the party or the party leaders who really run the infrastructure, right? And I think that's where the lessons haven't necessarily been internalized, is in those organizations and those institutions on the party side. Yep. Um, but the really exciting part after 2016 were that organizations like Indivisible and Swing Left, an acronym that I started, they, they popped up and they didn't have to be sort of blessed. We just kind of just were it. disruptors yeah. and we did it. And the other thing that happened was that a lot of people that had never funded political work, especially democratic political work, started to be like, terrified when Trump was elected and wanting to get involved. A lot of folks from Silicon Valley, which was controversial and written about and things of that nature. But I mean, I certainly benefited from some of that new energy and resources acronym did because those folks came in. They won, understood technology and how information flowed online. And they also were more inclined to take risks. I'm, think, I'm, I'm friendly with some of these people. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I love the fact that they stepped up and did something uh, about it and the fact that they funded you uh, so so the the individuals i'm thinking of are reed hoffman and lorian powell jobs That's right. both of whom i like and admire yeah they're they're both wonderful and reed has been a very strong supporter and backer and is still my lead investor at good information inc to this day and um you know he's he he invested in this work for absolutely the right mission driven reasons but also was unafraid to take risks and also encouraged failure because failure is how we learn and there's this risk aversion in politics and democratic politics i can't speak to republican i've never worked in the republican party nor do i ever see that happening um but there's well, i mean the republican party is losing its uh, shit right what really? is the republican I mean, all, party today yeah. right it's and and so i i really appreciated that because the risk aversion and the over reliance on on polling and micro targeting it's like you just miss the force through like for the trees, right? You're not actually, you know, listening to instincts or trying new ways of approaching this. And we live in a really disruptive age across the board. You you can't compete if you don't experiment, if you don't throw things at the wall, if you don't get scrappy and if you don't take risks and if you don't make mistakes. So for, for people who don't know Reed Hoffman's background, he was uh, the founder of LinkedIn. Uh, he was also one of the founding members of PayPal. Um, and so they, they've tried With a lot Peter of things. Yeah, they, but they've tried a lot of things that haven't worked. Let's put it that way, yeah. <laughs> you know. And, and so, so Reed and a lot gets of things it. that have that have made him a very, very, very wealthy man. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, and, and then when they find something that does work, they lean into it. Um, so, uh, you That's know, right. I so I, I completely applaud uh, the fact that Reed is trying to solve what is one of the most pressing problems of today that you're trying to solve, which is misinformation, the uh, demise of local media. So, what the heck? can be done to solve this problem? What was your pitch to read and then what did we... <laughs> um, so I, we, I mean, we we took a very, um, we took a very Silicon Valley ask approach at acronym of pilot, pilot different things and ideas, scale what works and fail quickly what doesn't. And something that I was personally obsessed with for a long time from my, my early journalism career and even just um, being much younger and, and sort of watching how you know, we didn't call it disinformation then, but how the, the Bush administration spread a lot of propaganda to start a war after 9-11, I was really obsessed with the role of right wing media in society, in our politics, in our media ecosystem generally. And, you know, they've been around for a really long time. They they built talk radio and Fox News in contrast to what they saw as a liberal mainstream media. Don't think they were necessarily wrong about sort of the liberal kind of at leanings of the mainstream media at that point in time, you know, and we're talking about the 90s. And and yet that pushed mainstream media into a very defensive position, right? Sure. Lifting at both sides, being like, we're not liberal, uh, which started to, you know, pave the way to being able to uphold lies, um, blatant lies from, from Republican candidates and elected officials, and of course our former President Trump, um, as equivalent to facts from the other side to try to show all sides and that really did a disservice because it sowed even more mistrust, I think, um, among people around who to trust. And 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 so in 2017, when I started Acronym, I had I had written a research paper with a, a few friends and colleagues, um, including Eli Pariser, who started. Well, I just want to stop for a yeah. because like, you, you completed that thought in a way that um, that I didn't expect, which was I thought you were going to say that the rise of the conservative media and the Fox universe or whatever pushed uh, uh, other organizations like uh, to the left. But what you said is that no, it put pressure on them to 
uh, to accept statements on both sides as, uh, as being uh, equivalent. So l let me just go through some of the different media orgs. So you were at CBS. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think what you're describing is like it would push like the CBS's of the world or like the ABC's to to try and uh, like take take more balanced tone. And then uh, like I, I would argue that it probably pushed like, you know, the CNN's of the world, like probably to be more of an oppositional uh, force to, to Fox. Is that um, I, I think that's right. I mean, definitely we saw after Trump was elected, CNN move far to the left because that's what would drive engagement and views and clicks, right? It's always comes down to business um, strategy, I think. But yeah, we saw this defensive posture. We still see it today. It's still a real challenge in legacy news organizations like The Washington Post and The New York Times. Uh, but, you know, we certainly saw it in the lead up to 2016 with the coverage of Hillary's emails and then not seeing the equivalent coverage of other things of greater import or even scandal um, during the Trump administration. So there's there is this issue at hand and I don't have the perfect solution for it, but the real issue was is that it created a real vacuum where there was a right wing media driving conservative and Republican agenda. Yes. A mainstream media just trying to protect their existence and so lifting up both sides and not wanting to be seen as one side or the other or liberal based on, you know, who their backers were or their, what, you know, who their producers voted for. And then Democrats, all they had left in their arsenal because they didn't have either media supporting them was paid advertising. Billions of dollars in television. The, the ads wouldn't, and wouldn't people say that the Democrats had, like, let's say, I don't know what time frame we're talking about, but like MSNBC, CNN, and, and sure. The, the I mean, MSNBC reaches a very small, small segment of like. So you're talking coastal. about you're talking about reach, really. I'm talking about reach yeah, to fine. to to the masses, to Americans. Yeah, that that, is, that could be a different. So. Yeah, and over decades, <laughs> yeah. right wing media built, you know, and it's not just Fox, right? It was Breitbart, and now it, it it's it's Daily Caller, Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, Dan bon, Dan Bongino, like. And, and and the the other big thing that I think about is conservative talk radio. That's I mean, right. like that that is a massive audience, incredibly and, and, influential, and, and there's a local version of that everywhere. That's right, and so as they grew this infrastructure on the right they started to really drive the meta narrative in this country and put Democrats at more of a defensive posture without real, you know, tools or weaponry to be able to push back in an effective way or drive their own narratives. And this has gotten even more complicated and more dangerous because Democrats really do. I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule, but they are incredibly concerned about always being factual and and accurate and moral in a way where we see the right they will say anything if it drive click, click drives clicks and attention they intentionally sow mis -hate, mistrust and hate and division and fear in order to be able to drive their agenda and then the media is just trying to play both sides and try to make sense of it to folks and 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 the right wing media's influence has really driven the narrative unless they lose their footing, which we've seen happen a few times. We saw it in the pandemic with Trump's botched response quickly. Republicans did not know how to pivot. I think we're seeing it with Russia right now because they're caught flat footed because so many of them were on the record and supporting a president who was, you know, touting Putin as a genius. And so outside of those types of circumstances, which are really powerful, they were able to push their wedge issues into the mainstream. I think our media is so tribalized now that if someone makes a mistake along the lines of what you're describing, it's not like viewers desert them in droves. Like, you know, like viewers are more likely to um, to stick around uh, as long as they keep getting the messages that they, they want. Like there, there, there's not like some absolute standard. It's like, oh, you you've screwed up like uh, on, on this issue. So now, you know, I don't believe in you anymore. At this point, people will believe uh, their favored that's outlet right. or individual or personality. That's right. And then a, another challenge to introduce, which is what we're really focused on solving for at Good Information and Courier, is that millions of Americans do not watch cable news, do not subscribe majority, to course, newspapers, yeah. the yeah, vast totally. majority, yeah. do not pay through paywalls, which is where traditional media has moved online. So 
they are getting their news and information scrolling their Facebook, their Instagram, their TikTok feeds. Well, one other thing I also want, want to say is that like you, you suggested something that at one point I thought was true, but now unfortunately I don't, which is you suggested that Democrats are like very, very locked into being like, you know, fact based and, and diligent, rigorous. And then the folks on the right will just be sensationalistic and play like fast and loose with the truth. Um, I do think that there is an equivalent version of that on the left now where, where they will be like very, yes. very inflammatory and like Absolutely. say things and like stretch things where and, and it's been very uncomfortable for me and a lot of people I know because like you used to believe that like, hey, if I you know subscribe to this news outlet, they'll be very, very responsible. And you'll be like, wait a minute, like I'm, I'm not sure I've actually been getting like, uh, you know, like. A well, I would describe that as farther to the left. Uh, the far left, truly, because I, I do think that uh, I think that to your point about how media has become so tribal, they really are small and very, very passionate, active communities yeah, that are think. engaging in those media. Yes. And the vast majority of the country, including regular Democratic and Republican voters, but mostly disengaged Americans, Americans who are not engaged yep. or don't know why they should be engaged right. in the political process. Sure. They're the audience that I'm most concerned about because they still are influenced by the halo of disinformation yep. that's reaching them. Right. Because there isn't a counter to it. And disinformation is its most most dangerous and effective in a vacuum. Yeah. So if there isn't other information to counter it that reaches them where they get their information, it wins, right? It's the, you you hear a lie three times, it's the truth. It becomes incredibly hard to unravel that. And that's the that's the environment most Americans are living in. Yes, I agree with, so I 100% I agree with the diagnosis of that problem. And I think about the thousands of voters I met on the trail, maybe they weren't voters, uh, really. It's like the, the random, cleaning person at the hotel right. in Iowa. It's like, where are they getting their information? Probably Facebook. That's right. You know? Right. Are there friends and neighbors who are getting it from Facebook or getting it from TikTok or WhatsApp? And, and they're not avid consumers of this stuff. They're not like, oh, no. every day I have to see what the heck is happening. Like that, you know, it's like living their That's lives, right. doing their thing. And then occasionally something filters through to them because they'll turn on the radio in their car or whatnot. That's right. And I'm, I, I'm fairly certain Courier Newsroom, the news organization that we started in 2019, is the first organization, the first news organization of its kind that is specifically focused on these passive news consumers, on reaching these individuals that no legacy media is focused on because they don't pay through paywalls. Cable news and talk radio aren't focused on because they aren't tribal, politically engaged. I like it. Activists. Trying to, to get information to the non super tribalized. That's right. And it's super hard because guess what? They don't want political news or information. No, they don't. So you have to, what like any want? business, you have to give your consumer what they want. Yeah. And then, you know, you hopefully are able to weave in the vegetables, as we call it. I think about the same stuff, Tara, where I'm like, okay, I'm going to try and give you some uh, meat and potatoes and then we'll like sl slip some vegetables in there. That's right. That's yeah. right. You have to. And that, I mean, that's how well, it's always been done in news organizations. This vegetable too. filled generally. I mean, I have not, need, I, I've You need some like, more candy. <laughs> some, <laughs> some Sorry, legs. listeners. Sorry it's so nutritious all the time. <laughs> that's right. But that's, I mean, that's what our challenge is. Our, so we have editors and uh, reporters and social content producers in eight states now. Love they it. live what in the states? communities they serve. We're in Arizona, Florida, Iowa, Michigan, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Wisconsin. Great places to be. Continue. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to go where the money wants you to go. I, I, and that's where, frankly, the most disinformation spreads. And given our electoral college, where uh, democracy kind of sits at stake yep. in these states and communities. Um, and our reporters and editors every day are you know, think they're living on these platforms because that's where these individuals are. And the so, platforms are? So our primary channels of distribution are um, skimmable email newsletters, yep. uh, Facebook, Instagram, and we're about to start piloting TikTok in a few states. Um, we Pilot that TikTok, it, Tara. Well. Yeah, but you have, to, you have to really lean on the creators because it's a totally different format now. It's a totally different format. Yeah. As someone who has a TikTok thriving now, TikTok account, seen check it. me out at official Andrew Yang. There you go. Um, so, and that's the other thing that's different about us. So we have a specific audience focus on like other news orgs. We go where they are and our journalists aren't writing long articles because this audience doesn't read them. So, so what do they read? Like so, what, what the, yeah. Oh, well, they like, don't read. <laughs> they skim. So it is, you have to package the information you want your audience to have in a graphic, 
a carousel, an Instagram reel, a TikTok video, and it has to be engaging. And so you can't rely on a long article or context or nuance. And it's sad, like I'll be clear, a lot of journalists will like roll their eyes when they hear this, right? But it's actually respecting the audience and their consumption habits. It's not the opposite. I think it's very smart. I think it's, you know, savvy. Um, But I'm still trying to figure out like what is on that Instagram uh, reel because, you you know, like you said, they don't care about politics on the daily. So what do they care about? They care about what's going on in their communities. You mentioned hyper-local things earlier. That's absolutely true. Um, They also care about information that affects them. So if you center them in all of your content and your reporting, it's, you know, does the... So is that weather? Is that entertainment? Like, what is that? Weather. Weather is huge. Sports is huge. Sports is also really unifying. It's the other reason that I decided to make Courier a local news network, which is harder in general, but it's because where you live in your community is something that 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 binds you together. You can build bridges with people who you don't agree with politically yep. or in other ways. And it is like sports, right? You can be on the same sports team, but really disagree about everything else. So if I live in a up. town in Wisconsin, uh, is there like a version of Courier News for, for me? So and Up like- North News. So every one of the newsrooms has their own name, their own channels, their own reporters and voices and personalities. Wow. So, so it's a little like micro paper delivered via social media and skimmable emails. That's right. It's it's really, it's it's distribution focused because we understand that you people don't come to you anymore in this media environment. You have to go to them. How many journalists do you all employ? So our whole staff is about 65 full time now across the eight states and a small HQ team. We centralize all of the data analytics reporting. We do our, do our own media buying in-house. And the third part of our model that is different from any news organization I've ever heard of is that we measure the impact of it. And that's really important. How the heck because, do you do that? So our mission <laughs> is to make a more informed, engaged, and representative America. Um, That's the mission of a lot of news organizations, I think. They'd call it different things. But our model is is focused entirely on the audience that isn't politically engaged, that is lower information, passive news consumers, meeting them where they are with information that is actually relevant to them, and then understanding it if actually increases their turnout in elections. And not for who they vote for, but do they turn out? And across our eight states, 10 million Americans voted for the very first time in their lives after 2016. It is critical to keep them informed and engaged and voting because if they vote a second or a third time, they can turn into lifetime voters. If it was a one-off because they were scared of the threat of Trump, which a lot of those people were, they might not vote again and might be even less engaged. So this is really the model is how do we keep them engaged? So on the measurement side, we actually run experiments. We boost our news coverage to these audiences. We hold a control group out like like a medical randomized control treatment experiment. Uh, and then we look at the difference in turnout between those different audience segments after an election. Wow. Uh, one of the things that really struck me um, in 2020, so uh, I thought that people would, must be really tired of Trump. I mean, AU was botching COVID, and I endorsed several dozen candidates in swing districts around the country thinking like, oh, this is going to be a really great opportunity. Love so many of these candidates. Uh, And what stunned me was that turnout for those candidates did go up. Many of them were second time candidates, Mm -hmm. but then turnout surged on the other side as well. Uh, And the vast majority of the candidates that I was backing uh, ended up getting swamped by increased turnout for Trump in these locations. So when you talk about the 10 million voters who voted for the first time in these eight states, it's probably on both sides. Um, and so uh, is is it such that Courier News is uh, informing like a critical mass uh, of voters um, on both sides or like, like or yeah, it sounds like it would be. Yeah, I mean, we're really explicit about our values. A lot of people will call Courier progressive because of those values. I think a lot of our values and, and, shouldn't be partisan. Yeah, what are those values? We believe in science and climate change. Sure. We believe in reproductive rights and freedom. We believe in social and racial justice, and we believe in democracy. And we also believe that there needs to be a strong democracy for there to be a free and independent press in this country, among other things, all the nice things that we'd like to have and keep. And so we are explicitly pro-democracy, and that guides the editorial strategy of the organization. 
I think being pro-democracy should definitely not be uh, partisan or controversial. It <laughs> I mean, shouldn't, like, but like, like, hasn't but it, it become is. that way? Oh, yeah, yeah. It really has. And so, and what we really mean by pro-democracy coverage, too, is accountability for individuals, elected officials, leaders in, in our states that are actually trying to dismantle or make it harder to vote for Americans. And that's a, that's a huge threat to this country. And we know what it can do in seeing what's happening in Eastern Europe right now. So you employ 65 people. Uh, many of them, though, are journalists who are in these communities. Yes. Uh, or do, who so all used to work and, for state or local newspapers yeah, yeah. before. And so they, 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 they managed to be able to keep doing their jobs, though it's, I'm sure, a very different job um, yes. with, with, with you all. It is. And it's and we we're constantly talking about this internally, too, that this is hard because we're, I really believe that we're at the forefront of where media news needs to go writ large. Yep. And we're really trying to build new muscles because I, I went to journalism school. You're taught, you know, that once you've reported something right, once you've shed light on corruption, you've published your story, your job is done. Right. Yep. You've done good. There's a last mile problem there. It, and it's why I was frustrated when I wasn't journalism. Nothing happens after you, right? right. Thing. You, you're not closing the loop there. You're not making sure that it's reaching the right people. You don't know the impact that the coverage is having. And most news organizations do believe, and it is their strategy, that it's that is we are here to inform the decision makers and the elites, and then that will push policy change or push progress, what have you. The problem there is that there's a huge swath of the the electorate that is not getting informed at all and instead are getting disinformed, which then causes barriers, right, to getting real change done, to having balanced government, to having a functional government. And so our theory of the case is really, if we inform and we build trust with these communities that other people are not reaching out to day in and day out, that they will not only be informed, but empowered and feel a sense of agency I like and it. participate. I love it. I mean, you're, you're trying to, uh, to reach people that right now most people don't care about or try and reach. You try and reach them in a very modern tech savvy way in a format that will actually be additive to their lives. And they're just like on their Instagram and then they're like, oh, you know, <laughs> like this That's right. thing. Pop I mean, I like love all of it. The thing that uh, I found frustrating when I was a, a, what what's called a social entrepreneur, you're calling it a civic entrepreneur, is you look at it and you're like, okay, I'll speak for myself and I'll share, share a bit about it. So I uh, started an organization, Venture for America, to try and uh, train aspiring entrepreneurs uh, and channel them to cities like St. Louis, Detroit, Baltimore, New Orleans, Birmingham, et cetera. I don't know if you know about uh, my background and past that way. Now, um, our budget uh, after a number of years was maybe in like the like six to eight million dollar range, something along those mm -hmm. lines, um, which uh, in the context of these kinds of organizations is, you know, like pretty good. Yeah. But I, I grew to believe that the problems I was trying to solve were 10,000 times bigger than that, because like my, my goal was not to do something that I, you know, was proud of, um, which I did, uh, but it was to actually help uh, the country through what I thought was an historic Effect economic transition. Uh, and then uh, I thought, well, how could you actually help overhaul the economy in a meaningful way? Landed on something very dramatic like universal basic income and then thought, well, there's no way to do that. That doesn't involve uh, taking hold of the federal government. And so how do you do that? Run for president of the United States. So it, it's a very it, linear path. That you no, very, I thought it was very logical. My wife agreed. Yes. My wife didn't necessarily agree. Anyway. <laughs> um, she came along. Yeah, she, she I'd be down. No, no, I mean, she got on board. Uh, she was on board from the beginning, but. <laughs> yeah, there's but what, but was she yeah. really, would she really make that leap? Uh, so in, in, it's a sacrifice. So in your case, like, I feel like this is a massive problem and you're, you're tackling a sweet spot in like a very, very smart way. Um, I do feel like the problem is getting worse around you all yes. the time. Um, so like right now, 
uh, there are advertisers on Career Newsroom. You are. How are you structured, organized? So, so we are. So we're a public benefit corporation. B Corp. Love them. We are. Yes. Um, and we did that for a number of reasons. I would have. I would have. I mean, there's a there's a huge movement and a lot of exciting work in saving local journalism that is very different than what we're doing. That's moving into the C three space, right? Relying on philanthropy. We're going to have to be right now because there aren't good revenue. Models I totally believe and agree space. with that too. Yeah, yes. I so we did a public benefit corp because we have a hybrid model. So our primary revenue stream is under writing mission aligned organizations and individuals who believe in our mission who want to support it and they can fund either specific areas of coverage like our coverage of you know so, localizing the impacts of climate change so when you go into a town do you get local funders no um so in we have in-state funders for some of the newsrooms for sure because you can cover you can underwrite coverage areas specific newsrooms if you care about building that infrastructure in your community um or just the mission writ large just because you support it so we rely on those underwriters. We disclose our underwriters. Um, it's a, a lot of nonprofit organizations and individuals that believe in the work. That is the primary source of revenue. So we call it impact revenue. And then now that we've built a large subscriber base across the network, we have over 620,000 subscribers Congrats. and social followers. Awesome. Um, thank you. The team has worked really hard on this. And it's all about building trust. This is not an easy audience by, by definition. So now that we do have that base audience, we can start to monetize. We will never charge for our content to these audience because that defies our oh, model yeah, no, and our they, purpose. Like, these people don't pay for That's content right. that way. But now we can recruit sponsors for the newsletters. We want to hold civic town hall events in all of our states and communities, have sponsors to be able to support that work too and start to diversify our revenue. So we're not relying on traditional ads because you would need to drive people to websites and our audiences do not read articles. So we're not gonna drive them through spammy memes like a lot of media organizations do when it, it doesn't serve our bottom line long-term. Congratulations. So it, 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 this is, so if there is like a person listening to this, is like, ooh, I love this. Um, they don't live in one of these states or, or communities necessarily. Do you have like donors and grassroots donors? Absolutely, that, that, that sort of yeah. You can go to couriernewsroom.com. Follow us on Twitter at Courier Newsroom, and you can you can see all of the handles for all of the eight newsrooms too to support them. So anybody can support the work on the website or any of the state new, uh, websites. And then um, we're also I'm really really excited about this. We're launching a content organizing program this year. Another thing most news organizations don't do, but to try to really bring more of the great news coverage into the communities in different spaces online. Where are the messaging apps and the Facebook groups and other things that are having discussions about what's happening in their school board meetings, about what's happening as it pertains to climate or clean energy in their communities, things that affect them to make sure that we're actually meeting them where they are with this good information. And, and this is definitely uh, a plea to your audience and, and community, is to just evangelize the idea of sharing more good information. Yeah, amen. Because the other side does this. And and I don't mean to say the other side as though we're, we're one side and the other, but well, no, right well, wing. Th th there's something where uh, lies uh, are six times more likely to spread right. quickly and powerfully. Um, and we all know this, like the more zany and sensationalist and out there and inflammatory, like like that, there are a lot of people being like, send, send, send. For it, for it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, you also maybe. know the power of movement building and trust, right? Your community trusts you. They're going to go to bat for you. They're going to take actions. And I think a lot of people in this country are really concerned about disinformation because they have family members they've lost to it. Yeah. They have friends. And and so it is a very, very simple and easy thing anyone can do. They just understand that it matters. You know, posting something on your Instagram story or on your TikTok, you don't know how many people who trust you and know you from some walk of life are actually going to have their mind changed by that. And I think it really is just about building that muscle because the instinct is to is to share the most salacious or, you know, the the most kind of wild or conspiracy driven stuff. So uh, here's my sense of things. And you probably have some, again, updated numbers. So uh, over 2000 newspapers have gone out of business locally. Uh, the journalism industry as a profession is just getting decimated. I don't know what that uh, that set of numbers is, but, you know, you have like tens of thousands of journalists, probably hundreds of thousands that have left their jobs and exited the field, which, by the way, on the record, makes me sad because uh, I think uh, journalists uh, are, for the most part, like just 
uh, folks who like to write and wanted to share stories about their community. And like, it's not that lucrative a profession for the most part. Nobody gets into journals and to make money. Yeah. And so, uh, so some, some things uh, about young Andrew is that like when I was very young, I read a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons and science fiction novels and the fantasy novels, that sort of thing. Um, and so there's a period when, you know, I was like writing very terrible, like juvenile versions of that. And then there were like, uh, there's a point where you're like, oh, maybe I'd want to write. And so then there's like a, a mo like I've always liked and admired journalists. Um, and then seeing them just get all uh, fired or whatnot, like has made me sad. Now, some some people and this is also something that's tempered me. So uh, I ran for president, interacted with dozens of journalists, like different levels, uh, ran for mayor, interacted with dozens of journalists. Um, and, and I've had journalists do really shitty things. Uh, <laughs> I can, so have I, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> and so that there is like part of you now where it's like, like my, my, uh, natural sympathy for journalists like o over time has been like you know because I know there are some people who like frankly like mistrust journalists um, uh, and I'm someone who typically has wanted to give people uh, the benefit of the doubt um, but then I've seen like you know um, these distortions um, uh, and if I'm going to be favorable about or generous about it it would be like look you have a field where people are now under these enormous pressures, uh, economic and professional and otherwise, and that is going to end up driving worse behavior uh, over time. I was going to say it comes down to incentives, right? And I yeah. do I do think, I mean, Mike, I'll just speak from my personal experience. Uh, I have a lot less, uh, a lot fewer bones to pick with uh, local and state journalists I've ever met than yeah, yeah, national true. political journalists. They have uh, it's a very different agenda, but it does, it comes down to incentives. They're incentivized to drive clicks and shares and engagement on their content. And, and it is worse for these national types because they're trying to get to like these broad internet audiences, whereas right. like the local paper, it's like they, they're not used to trying to get that's right. a bajillion clicks on their stuff. Uh, another story uh, that I'll, I'll relate, which is uh, in my last book, which uh, was campaigning around Iowa and New Hampshire and interacting with dozens of local journalists. But those stuff, like the newsrooms were disappearing. I'd show up. And it would be like a half empty building or two thirds empty building. And the people that were there, like someone said to me, it's like, this is going to be the last season when you actually even have like local journalists who are like follow a candidate around to tell their stories in New Hampshire or Iowa or, or whatnot. And that made me feel really bad too. I also have in the story that uh, the major Iowa paper that all the presidential candidates wanted to spend time with was the Des Moines Register, which as you know, was purchased by a uh, hedge fund mm -hmm. um, during the midst of that campaign. So imagine like I was hanging out with this Des Moines Register reporter and then she confided in me that all of her colleagues are worried about their jobs because they just got bought by, um, you know, I forget which hedge fund it was, it's in my book. Um, and, and, and so you, you, you really think about just how completely screwed up this landscape is. So to complete my thought, you have thousands of local papers, tens of thousands of journalists get jettisoned. Um, in my mind, you have this for-profit business model that just doesn't work anymore. Um, and, uh, and so you need to substitute in uh, philanthropy. In my mind, it has to wind up being publicly financed to be at the proper scale. Um, so there was legislation, still is, being proposed the Local Journalism Sustainability Act that would channel yep. um, not even that huge an amount of money in the scheme of things, uh, maybe like a billion, two billion, uh, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. What do you think the size of the hole is? Um, gosh, that's a great question because I spend so much of my time focused on some of the challenges and gaps in the existing model. And I think there's a lot of incredible efforts to save and bolster the existing model that are not also addressing how that model is still broken. Oh yeah, so I, I, like I think that that's different stuff, layers. As you to can the tell, problem. I'm frustrated by that. Right. It's like, look, like you know, you're freaking hemorrhaging. It's like, you know, hey, I can make you bleed a little bit less. 
Right. It's like, yeah, that's solving the problem. It's like, no, like what? <laughs> we have to do. We have to do it all. Is the answer? Unfortunately, we have to do it all. This it's it's just a difficult question to answer the scale of the problem because there there are these different layers to it, and there's an ama there's amazing efforts like the American Journalism Project and amazing startups like Chalkbeat, which I know that you've had folks Elizabeth on. Elizabeth Green and Chalkbeat, absolutely, and yeah. that are doing really really incredible work to save this industry and and really address it in thoughtful ways. Report for America is another one that yep. is staffing and subsidizing local journalists and communities. Yep. These are all so important. I do think public financing needs to be a piece of the solution too. It is, it, the, the challenge before us though is not just saving local journalism, it's shifting how we do journalism in this country and how we think about distribution given distribution has changed. And it's not, it's not a real new or novel challenge. It's happened every time new media has been introduced, right? From like the printing press through television, talk radio, what have you, the internet, social media, it's gonna continue to adapt and change. And media is now so increasingly decentralized that we need to have also more investment in innovative models that focus on communities that aren't the highest Income ROI. consumers. Yeah, sure. That's right. And we don't because all of the startups that I'm hearing about that get big money, like the, you know, the new Ben Smith one, I'm not gonna remember the name, which is gonna be a problem for them. There's a word there, semaphore maybe. But like there are these new startups and, and they're they're not bad necessarily, but they're all focused on elite audiences, yep. on high information consumers. Meanwhile, our democracy is on the brink. Yep. And we're not doing enough as a society, as a government, as a democratic party, to really focus on this information divide and gap, and these these efforts still feel too piecemeal to me and too small. Yes, and that, I mean that, that's sort of what the point I'm getting. That, at. Yes, that's yeah, exactly yeah. right. And like I, I don't expect Courier to be a silver bullet because there isn't going to be one or a solution. We did build it in a way that was very intentionally scalable because we need more scalable solutions. It, it does feel like people should be just pumping funds into Courier so that it, instead of being 65 people, it's 6,500 people. It's, and instead of, you know, like these eight papers, it's like 800 or 8,000. We we would welcome that. That's not really the environment. <laughs> because no, there's no, still no, a real learning the curve there though, right? It's Well, so this is one of the things too, I learned, uh, you know, the the uh, through experience with Venture of America. So check it out. I'm a social entrepreneur, you know, doing my thing. <laughs> it's like 2011, hanging out with uh, awesome people. 2012, 2013. So then you get an audience with a billionaire and Reid Hoffman is like an exceptional billionaire in, in, in my view. Reid Hoffman yes. actually got uh, donated to Venture for America. Um, but you, you get an audience with a billionaire and then you're like, hey, you know, if I can just convince this billionaire of my thing and then like all their problems will be over. And then, um, and then the, this billionaire, uh, it turns out that if you're a billionaire, you don't necessarily operate in increments of like, you know, uh, 5 million or 10 million, like you might operate in increments of like one or 200,000. So then like you, you get like one or 200,000 from said billionaire. And then you're like, okay, like, I'm like glad for that. But you know, like, like, is that going to be able to solve like, you know, this problem? And I, I'm just going to throw a couple numbers at what I like, if you're going to yeah. estimate what the journalism problem is. Um, so let's say you have like 2,000 local papers that are out of business and you could like, re you know, replace some of their key functions the way Chalkbeat is like on yeah. the cheap and the rest of it. Um, but you'd still be looking at, you know, uh, in my mind, let's say like a million bucks um, per. So you're, you're, you're looking at, um, uh, you know, very quickly. Uh, like a couple billion, like at it's, least. It, it, it's at least a couple billion. It, it's a it's, it's at least a couple billion dollar annualized right. problem. Now, can you so so that like and then you'd be like, hey, can I get some revenue sources to defray pieces of that couple billion? Like you know, um, maybe it's a three or four billion dollar problem. You can get one or two billion in revenue, whatever it is. Sure. Um, maybe these numbers are off by like uh, in, but e this is the, probably the minimal, as you say. Like this would right. be like the lowest thing. Um, and contrast that to a trillion dollar a year disinformation economy that we live in. That yes, we're competing with, right? exactly. It's like what right. what is and this is one thing I'm like very very I'm working on. I'm uh, frustrated by it because I've been in the rooms and like you say they're like piecemeal and hodgepodge and different people doing different right. things and they're they're like folks who are trying to bring it together but even as they bring it together, um, it's being underinvested in uh, and and so you you look at it like you know uh, so some of the questions I asked when I was running for president it's like hey. Like, you know, if you were to put a, a price tag on climate change, like what would you put it on? And people are like, you know, you think about that one and it's like, you know, and then I tell yeah. you for context, like the U.S. economy is 22 trillion per year. 
So then like if you had to throw and then people could come up with just about any number for climate change and to be right, because by the way, you know, it's also going to kill people and, and the rest of it. Um, so then it'd be like, hey, what's the price tag you'd put on democracy? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking yeah. this question every day now Is this because, what you're doing? Yeah. because nothing else matters if we don't if we don't protect democracy in this country. Like everyone's business interests are tied to this. Every philanthropist interests are tied to this. It, it's if you don't have a functioning democracy, are you going to be able to address climate change or any other no. stuff that you're plowing like hundreds of millions of dollars into? Absolutely not. And yes. that's that's also that's the disinformation ecosystem, right? It's so much bigger than politics. It's democracy, it's public health, as we know from yes. vaccine disinformation, it's public safety, it's climate. It affects all of this. Like if you're not addressing the information ecosystem problem and incentive structure in this country, you're not addressing any of those problems yeah. in a meaningful way. Yeah, it, it's uh, a very compelling case. Like I make a version of that case and then you circulate around and you find some people and then some people are like, you know what, Tara, this is great stuff. Two hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> or whatnot, and, and, and then and then you're you're grateful because you're like, well, you know, da, da, da. but at the same time, you're like, you know, like this, like, you know, it's slipping away, and we've got like a couple billion dollar hole, and it needs to be subsidized. And I do believe also that there's a massive market opportunity in local news yeah. that's coming, and so it's the startup needs to grow and scale now when we don't have a lot of time, and there is this urgency around our democracy, and. And then I do believe that it will be able to pay for itself because I think the ecosystem will continue to shift and change. Oh, there 100 percent are ways for these local publications to at a minimum be break even. The problem right now is that uh, if you have a public company, it's not enough to break even. You have to show, like, let's call it double digit margins. And then that's not enough because you have to show a growth rate right. uh, uh, of X. Right. And so if you are uh, financial operator, you come in, you buy the Des Moines Register, uh, you look up and be like, what's that? You're breaking even? Well, that's terrible. Like, time to fire. <laughs> you know? right. Like, these folks and sell the real estate and then we'll like, you know. Yeah. Um, and this is a, a different rabbit hole. We definitely don't have time to go down fully, but we don't have good capital instruments in this country for actual impact where you're you're not actually driving for a financial return, you're driving for a social impact return. We have different models and you hear about it, but at the end of the day, it still ends up coming down to that financial return. And we're at a point in our society and in our democracy right now where we actually need our elites and our billionaires to subsidize this work at scale for the foreseeable future. And they don't need to cover the entire cost. There will definitely be revenue streams. But I think that there is a culture shift that needs to occur here. And I and I do believe that it's it's coming close to the point where we hit rock bottom and it happens out of fear and urgency. But we're not quite there yet. I've got two things I'm going to pitch to you. Uh, well, so one is called the Impact Genome Project. Have you heard of this thing? I don't think so. All right. So what you were just suggesting just now is like, look, everything is around financial returns. It turns out some of the most important things don't have an immediate like dollar amount attached to them. But if you don't invest in them, we're all fucked. Um, totally agree. Uh, and so one of the big ideas that uh, I was championing was like, look, like we have to actually start measuring outcomes, like human centered outcomes, yes. where instead of saying new like, KPIs, like, uh, yes, new yes. KPIs. Um, so I called it the American scorecard. Uh, and you can include healthy democracy on there. And then like, what is the return on that? Yeah. The the early effort in this space is social impact bonds, which is like I'm going to invest in an outcome. So if you can like help kids like learn better or whatnot, like that's worth 10,000 bucks a pop to me. So I'm going to give you a billion and then you can demonstrate you did it for yep. like, a, like a thousand kids. Now, the social impact bond market is still relatively like nascent and like undercapitalized to your point. Um, so uh, the Impact Genome Project, awesome entrepreneur um, in, in Chicago who is trying to say like, look, don't invest in activities, invest in outcomes or results. Mm -hmm. um, so just like, you know, it could be a private company, it could be a nonprofit uh, that, that addresses it. And, and so one of the reasons they do this is because there's a sense that we have that I happen to co-sign on is, is that like uh, a lot of our government operations are not very uh, results oriented and it's just like a politician shows up cuts the ribbon is like hey i did this thing started this program it's like did the program deliver who the hell knows someone looks at it later and is like oh no like rebrand it do this and like no one knows whether anything happened and american people are like oh i don't know if i believe this stuff uh, at this point so the impact genome project is trying to say like look 
everyone should just be trying to measure the outcome and the result. So I just had a vision, which is that you have an economy of the future that has uh, multiple things that you can invest in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, uh, now I happen to believe that the government should be capitalizing this at like a very high level. Um, I think the government should be publicly subsidizing local journalism to the tune of billions of dollars and I'd have zero problem with that. Now there are a lot of folks who, you know, dislike that um, because they, they think like, oh, the government can't be a part of well, this. Oh, what happens this, when Trump is president again if he is system. and he and, owns the media. And I'm just like, look, and my, my uh, I mean, there are a lot of arguments that I think are, you know, would work. But one of the things I say is like, look, town library. Do you have a problem with the town library? It's, 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 it's like public. Who has the problem with the town library? library. Publicly, like that, that is what the town paper is the equivalent yeah. of, really. Um, you're just conditioned to think that the media is a for-profit business and the library or the post office is not. It's like at this point, like the local paper is the town library or the equivalent. Um, it should be with protections, right? And safeguards around it. Yeah. Or well, the other thing I could say is like, hey, like uh, uh, NPR, PBS, like, do you really think someone in Washington's like telling the local NPR station what their editorial choice is? Like, no, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or you could say like, hey, look, other countries, you know, like there are like all sorts of the, these Absolutely. models. So so there, there should be a massive public investment in various goals, whether yeah. it's climate resiliency, sure. local journalism, right? Put these pillars. Mental in place health that outcomes. We need to have a healthy populace, a healthy environment, a healthy society. With, with, with the major context being that right now we, we have untold uh, stock market uh, wealth and record highs, and then our quality of life is just degrading and disintegrating, which ends up leading to authoritarianism, especially if you have. A two-party system that artificially ends up empowering, like you know, like right. uh, we're on a fast track. Yeah, we, yeah, we we've we've set up structures that are facilitating this yeah. descent. That's right. Uh, and there are people like you who are trying to make things better, but um, you know, like it's the 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 struggle you have um, is something I'm familiar with. Is like, hey, like we have to just be doing more faster. More faster, yes. And, like take the risk and like. And, Pile in, yeah. Yeah. And just, and I really do think it comes down to people really understanding the ROI around democracy on this stuff and that there isn't going to be one solution. As Everybody's it is. looking for one solution. There's not going to be one solution. Well, you need to invest in a lot of different things that are trying to do this work with the real purpose and mission in, at heart of it. Well, you're certainly a piece of the puzzle. I mean, like I, you, you're saying like, look, I'm not the silver bullet, but like I'll tell you, you are a bullet. <laughs> I'll take that. I'll be yeah, a bullet, yeah, yeah. right? But also, you, you know, when you're a first mover in anything, it's hard, and you're going to get all the criticism. You're closer you're to gonna... a silver bullet than uh, than most anything. No, I've, but the, I've seen. the goal is because then... if you had like a revved up courier newsroom, it's like would would there be more? I mean, that's still the goal, right? We're a lot more revved up than we were, and we made our first acquisition. Tying back to your Iowa story, Iowa starting line. They were going to close their oh, doors. Oh, wait, They're snap. They're in the Courier Network. No way. Absolutely. Is that Pat Reiner? Pat Reiner. He's the editor. He's been the editor. He was the founder of it. Came into the network. And, and where we where we agreed is he's like, look, the model we were doing weren't working. People are just getting flooded with disinformation in Iowa. So you it doesn't know, matter how much accountability journalism we do if we're not actually informing Iowans. Oh, th th this makes me so happy because I don't know if you know, like me and Pat hung out. Yeah. Pat's hung out with all the presidential candidates. So you're not no, that but, special. But, no, but I hung out with Pat. I mean, <laughs> I Tara, know. like he hung out with his other folks now. Uh, but like I, I see them all over the place and yeah. I, I have a real fondness for Pat's uh, fantastic. He inspired me for many years before I started Courier with what he was doing in Iowa. And then you were able to come back and acquire him. He, were, well, <laughs> he wrote kidding. a blog post about how they were going to have to shut their doors. I cried. I called him and we figured it out. And that was last year. Look at that. So, saving our first local, acquisition. It, it brought us to eight newsrooms. Saving local journalists. We're trying. Doing our best. So I guess now you, your crew is rooting for Iowa to stay the first of the nation. <laughs> no. <laughs> that is, that is yeah, not where we're rooting for. <laughs> I thought we did away with caucuses. It'd be good for starting line. <laughs> Another thing for democracy. Um, yeah, no, but uh, but it's also really exciting to, I mean, exciting and terrible, but to be in a state where, uh, you know, it's it's bled really red in Iowa. And I actually believe that our model can make a huge difference in areas that aren't as saturated, like the battleground states with other media and well, investments. Th this is another point I made that like really that like does fire me up. So Obama won Iowa. 
Yes. Uh, uh, this is like a very, very purple state. Mm -hmm. uh, 94% white, rural. Yep. Um, now it's uh, R plus eight or so. Um, there are Democratic members of Congress in the Axne uh, and Democratic leaders and mm -hmm. candidates, many of whom I, I like and consider friends. But that environment is just going redder and redder. Um, and the Democrat, you know, the response of the Democratic Party to that, like, who Leave cares? Where, who cares? We're going to go to Arizona or Georgia That's right. Um, because those environments are more diverse. That's right. Uh, and uh, I hear this and I think, well, like, why don't you like go to Iowa and explain to them why they don't matter anymore? Uh, and by the way, this is just going to speed up racialized polarization in our country mm -hmm. where you're going to look up and say, uh, rural white areas? Well, can't win here. You know, like, uh, let, let's just go to like it, it. Like I'm fearful that's happening across the board generally. Right. Like there's starting to be plans in motion because Roe v. Wade is likely to be overturned in June about there's just going to be states where women can get an abortion in this country and states where you cannot. And 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 that's where planning is coming into place about like, OK, we're going to have we think we're divided now. When it comes to this, we are we are absolutely it's why I left politics. Frankly, it was a big reason is I felt like I was part of the problem of polarization. Political ads do that. They continue to sow mistrust. People don't want to be they don't feel a part of the system. They feel they're being lied to. They feel they're being taken advantage of. That's those feelings are really real. Yeah. And and, and to be an effective political operative, you have to activate that stuff. Yes. Yeah. And, and and also just to be an, an affected elected official, <laughs> government yeah, official, sure. like you have to understand where people are. And it isn't about politics when you're governing, except it is in America today. And I think that th there's always just been overinvestment in these states that that obviously matter because of the Electoral College. But but the lack, the moving from one to another and leaving the other behind and and not actually deploying a 50 state strategy to build bridges or, and everything. Like, to to the argument I made is like, look, Hey, Democrats, if you are losing Iowa and Ohio, states that you used to be competitive, competitive. and win in not that long ago, 12 years ago, right. uh, and now you're losing by eight, nine points, uh, maybe the problem is that things have gotten worse for the people in those states uh, and the stuff you've been talking about is not really like, you know, doing the trick or helping. Right. Um, and so for me, it was like, like, maybe you should be investing in like, that reality and, and oh by the way like you know that that would be great for the country it'd be great for your party be great for everyone um but the the democratic party is not actually geared to try and improve the lives of iowans or ohioans um the democratic party is geared to eke out a win in the next election uh and so then they're they're going to drift towards uh Arizona or Georgia, like the where the demographics are shifting, where right. things are becoming more urban. Uh, and so the the lives of the people just become, you know, like unimportant. Um, and that that was something that troubled me greatly. Let's put it that way. It's like like, like at this point, like, how, how do you expect that to to change? And I congratulate you for say, saying, like, look, I'm going to put down the partisan hat and create this unifying like wholesome local news organization that's going to try and meet people where they are and deliver information to them in a way that's additive to their lives and improves their information environment. Yes. But like, I'd imagine like actually just like improves their sense of local engagement because there's like a local publication that cares about uh, them and, and, you know, will notify them about what's going on in their own community. And also just making sure some of the information of what government does good for communities when it does good reaches people. Journalists don't have an incentive to cover that. You're trained not to. You're contrarian. And yet that also builds mistrust. Like yeah. The trust crisis in America right now is really, really, really dangerous. Like people don't trust one another. They don't trust institutions. That's what's going to lead to authoritarianism. Yeah. This, this dynamic you just described, too, is like a bit of like a. So if you talk to journalists, too, about this public financing, and the rest of it. Um, one of the responses you'll get is like, no, like the journalist's job is to speak truth to power, which is this adversarial That's stance you're talking about. So if like a random government official does something positive and it's like, oh, you know, like it made these people's lives better. It's like, yeah, I don't care about that. Right. Like, you where's know, the gotcha? Where's the negative? Yes. Here? That's exactly right. Yeah. It's, and it's a huge problem. Yeah. 
Yeah, because we really don't. And then it becomes reliant on the parties to advocate their own cases. And that's not also how it should be either. Facts are facts. The truth should get out. When something is good for a community, people should know it, right? It's like there was a, a recent poll a few weeks ago where Americans feel like they're doing better economically, right? But they feel like the country's economy is going in the wrong direction. And they also had absolutely no awareness that Joe Biden has created more jobs as president than past presidents. Like that information is not reaching people at all because it's not the controversial storyline or angle that journalists are gonna drive more clicks or that their editors are gonna ask of them. There, there is a real bias towards like the negative, the skepticism, the yes. sowing of mistrust type it's like, story. I, I, I'm not here to promote Joe Biden's policies. It's like, no, you're not. You're here to get the facts about what those policies are gonna do to these communities, to these individuals though, because they have a right to know. And honestly, it comes down to what is the information that is factual, accurate, honest, that that will help people make informed decisions at the polls. Yeah, it, it, it won't it persuade is. them, but it will let them have the information they need to make a decision about what matters to them. Yeah. One of the most discouraging uh, uh, facts uh, of the of the recent past uh, was my interview with Derek Thompson, a journalist at The Atlantic, about how now your perception of the economy is almost strictly based upon uh, how you feel about the party in power, and like, and then I was like, oh wow, like then we're really sunk if I, I can't yeah. actually convince you that things are better right. <laughs> based on them being better. Right. You know, it, right. it like they it, are it, better, <laughs> and I can't convince you of that because of who's behind it. Yeah. 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 That's, that, right. that's a rough world. So that's why we'll have a new party, right? Yeah, that's why we'll have a new party. That's right. Um, well, congratulations uh, on taking on a very, very important problem that actually is driving just about every other. Uh, problem. Um, and uh, I hope that people pile in and get behind you and Courier newsrooms uh, to the level that they should, um, because it's awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, like, I I'm just pumped that you're here to be able to share your work with us uh, and wish, wish you like freaking, you know, like all of the support and resource you need. Thank you so much, Andrew. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope to your whole community too. just the one simple thing to take away is to just share more good information and not think that the people in your community are already getting it because the odds are that they're not. And I think that, that that's where people can really make a difference before we have better models reaching folks. Share so. good information with Tara McGowan. Thank you so much, Tara. And really, congratulations. So it's awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Really, really great to be here.